having read that from the press release. So it's not all true. So like, uh, I think this is the first time I'm going to tell like, uh, you know, the real story of you know, what are the things I've been doing. Uh, I've been waiting for 11 months to, to share with you guys. Because um, uh, since the first National Youth Entrepreneur Convention last year, uh, I was personally inspired by the attendance and uh, that's why we're investing again this year uh, to share our experiences and the journeys of uh, you know, how we started our businesses. And uh, I, I don't think I've ever told this story to anyone, uh, probably not even Joanne, you know, of, uh, how we all started. Um, I wish I was ordinary, you know, uh, since I was young, but I was not. So I was a teacher's kid, you know, so going to school wasn't uh, a very pleasant experience. Yeah, but my parents find out about my exam results much earlier than me. <laughs> expecting me to get like 98% uh, you know, for every subject. Uh, but uh, after some time is when I realized that you know, uh, it was time for me to make my own decisions. So during that period when I was uh, still in high school, uh, a lot of decisions were made by my parents because both of them were educationists. Uh, education was, was the most important part of, uh, of life. You know? um, I, I dabbled in some sports like squash and I, I sucked in it. You know? I started when I was 10 years old. Um, I started at the same age as, uh, as Nicole David, you know, I, I played with her and I lost to her. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, all these are like the press release things, so it's one and only. I'm uh, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so um, the, the thing is that, you see, ever since I was young, I, I never discovered the winning, the, the secret of, of success. You know, and I think that's very important, you know, like uh, a lot of things that summed up today, a lot of excerpts, a lot of uh, quotes that have been said today, all these are like the secrets of success that, that really builds the character in you to, to take you to the next level. And, and since young, you know, like uh, because of the way my parents were, as uh, education is focusing me on only education and everything else, for example, like squash, it's just, it's just a hobby. You know, so even when, when I lost the game, you know, when I lost the girl, you know, so it's okay, you know, you, just go and study, you know, so just play for fun. <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm going to move on from there. So, so the thing is, uh, so right after Form 5, you know, uh, I, I had a choice to make a, a decision. I like, you know, what was the next step for me? I think probably that, that was the turning point for maybe most of you as well. Because uh, doing, uh, you know, when you're in high school, you know, you have your friends, you know, that, uh, you know, Form 4, you're going to this class, Form 5, you're going to the next class. But what happens after Form 5? You know, like, uh, what, what do you do? A-levels? Uh, Australian matriculation? Uh, do you go and work? Yeah. So then that was a turning point in my life. And, um, well, I, I have a brother that was four years older than me. And um, four years before me, you know, uh, education opportunities was not that great. Okay, so he applied for a few universities and he didn't get in. And eventually got into, uh, he got into UTM. But it was like a military kind of uh, scholarship, you see. So now he's like a major, you know. He's, I said like a major, you know, Kurt Nolan, the new major. Um, engineering degree, but he's a major. And, you know, he, that wasn't the, the, the life that he wanted to choose to live. You know, but he had that, he did not have the choice. So when I saw that, you know, when I saw him going through that, I knew that, you know, this, at this age, at 18 years old, at that point of time, that is the major decision that I was going to make. And somehow I chose engineering, like, you know, because um, I thought it was quite cool. Huh? <laughs> Maybe online, you know, I always read emails, you know, like, why women love engineers, you know? <laughs> you know, they get all those kind of spam, right? They get it all the time, right? So, yeah. so, so I went into engineering uh, because I was good in math and physics. Uh, that's the reason why I did it, yeah? Because I, uh, I felt that there was pressure from my parents as well to deliver. Uh, and, you know, if I go into, for example, biotechnology, I might have probably not graduate, you know? It's like, I hate chemistry and biology. Uh, except certain chapters of biology. <laughs> Dissecting the frog. Okay. <laughs> so then, uh, when, when I was uh, when I was uh, doing a, uh, I mean, when I was in engineering, I mean, of course, like ninety-five percent of, of uh, you know my classmates were guys, and uh, and the other five percent, yeah, not they, they don't they're, they're not so feminine, you know, so more than <laughs> they, they're good in math, you know. So that was not a sexist joke. Because, uh, all ladies had to find staring at me. <laughs> yeah, so, but at that point, that was bored, okay? I was uh, generally bored, you know, I was just doing, you know, my thing in and out, you know, going, going to college and doing like Bermudas and slippers, because like, I thought that, you know, it's, that means just routine for me. So I, I wanted to explore more things, then I went to rock climbing. So I spent actually two years uh, in college and university in rock climbing, and I did, I mean, like, I climbed every single day because I was bored, you know, every time after school, I go, I go for rock climbing, I, I, I rock climb, then I started teaching people, 
how to rock climb and started working in the rock climbing gym itself in Samin, um, which is closed now. Yeah. Uh, so, so I tried rock climbing for two years, you know, I became really good at it. And then I realized that you know, through that process of, of, of rock climbing, I, I found that you know, it's a lot of discipline, it's a lot of, you spend a lot of time and the tenacity you know, in, in being the best. You know, I, I was actually one of the best young climbers at that point of time. Because probably there were many young climbers as well. So, uh, then while I was rock climbing and teaching people how to rock climb, I so happened, you know, uh, met like uh, one of the top uh, modeling agencies, the agent, the agent of the top modeling agency. I was teaching how to rock climb. And uh, she said, you know, I should go in for a photo shoot. I'm like, uh, okay, you know. So I, so I went in for a photo shoot and uh, after that I got some jobs. You know, like uh, my first job paid me 150 ringgit for an hour of like a professional show. So that was crazy. It's, that's a lot of money, okay, because I was earning three ringgit in the rock climbing gym. And because I climb more than I work, you know, my shoes wear off faster, so like the pair of shoes is 250 ringgit. So like every month I don't see my salary, you know, I buy equipment back in return. Yeah, so, so I decided that, you know, uh, based on financial uh, situations, I decided to start, you know, going to uh, modeling and I started saving some money from there. Uh, then after doing a lot of modeling, I noticed that, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that was meeting out there, and, uh, asking me other stuff, you know, about young people, and uh, a few of my friends together to get to register a company without a business model. So we were like, hey, you know, let's register a company. And we registered this company with a few business friends because I was on engineering side, so I didn't know much about business. So like this business guy, you know, just come, hey, you know, register company, ROC, you know, so he, you know, he blabbers a lot about all this, you know, where do we can register and stuff. So I don't know nuts about it, but I thought it was really fun. Besides just staying in labs. So, so we registered a company without a business model, and then only we started to look for one. So I thought it was pretty, pretty silly. Huh? Probably some of you are going through it, you know, right now. <laughs> Maybe with some partners. And uh, so we, we started looking into MLM marketing companies, you know, uh, maybe some of you despise them, you know, some of you love them, you know, because they pay you really well. Uh, I'm, I'm neutral, okay, at this point of time. Yeah. Uh, so we looked into a lot of these ML related businesses, I was reading some of this stuff which doesn't really make sense to me. Uh, and then I listened to my parents' advice, you know, like, stay away from this MLM, you know, they read books about it. So I thought that was not a business that you know, I wanted to venture in. Uh, so I ended up starting a promoter company with my friends. Because yeah, like, I, I, I was doing part-time jobs, modeling and stuff. So a lot of clients wanted part-time promoters. So our first job paid us like 60 ringgit and I made like 15 ringgit from that. You know, of one week of work. Then I started finding a smarter way of doing things. I collected a lot of data, raised 5,000 young people. You know? so that's very easy. You know, to get 5,000 your friends, and you just go and sign up people for, for two weeks, you probably get a number of friends, you know, phone numbers, and I bought this SMS plus system which I never regretted buying even until today. So we in inserted all these numbers into this SMS plus system, and I told my clients, you know, if you want part-time, just come and find me. So after two, three months of, of dabbling into this, uh, we finally landed a Maxis, the Maxis 3G launch, and we were giving out like 100 promoters a day. So if you do the math, like 20, 15 ringgit per promoter that we make, you know, then we're making about 1,500 ringgit a day. So that's, that's quite uh, good for, for a start. And uh, after the first year, we actually made 1.2 million uh, revenue in terms of revenue. And but, but at that point of time, you know, I, I looked at the business model. Uh, I graduated, uh, and my parents were asking me to actually get an engineering job. Uh, so I, I looked at the business model, and I noticed that the business model is actually scaling linear in terms of like if I put in 10 hours, I'll get actually you know the, just 10 times the amount of, of money that I'm going to get if I put in one hour of work. So I, I wanted to look at what are the other types of business models that were more exponential, you know, that were more automated. I mean, we hear a lot about uh, recurring income and stuff. So then, uh, uh, so I decided to look this decision, and two years later, I, I decided to go and uh, step up my own uh, to start Youth Malaysia. And um, the business model for Youth Malaysia was, uh, you know, I didn't think through it really well as well. I thought, let's build the largest youth community in Malaysia. Doesn't really make sense, you know, if you think about it two years back. So then, uh, I mean, like, I was talking about, uh, we were looking at Rock and Buddha. What's Rock and Buddha doing, you know? Like, they're probably not doing anything. My brother has a card, Rock and Buddha, but he doesn't really do anything. Uh, X Fresh, like, I mean, some of you have heard of X Fresh, like, I don't know what happened to X Fresh. They, they have a radio station, but, you know, it's, it's not that great. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. anyone here listens to X Fresh? <laughs> so, so, <coughs> So the thing, it wasn't that straightforward. So I, I said, all oh, right, let's build the largest youth community. End of the day, right, I sent out proposals and, and we actually got a project which was Gagayu, and which was not in line with the business model of building the largest youth community. 
So some of you sometimes you expect, you know, like uh, you know, your vision to be this way, but you know, the, the path is not really a straight road. You know, sometimes you, you have to go through a few curves to get to where you want to go. And uh, we got our first project, Gagayu, which which sucked. Okay, I mean, like uh, Joanne would probably know, you know, she was uh, with us since the start. Uh, for three months, we had the 14 UC station, right? We collected one million messages, but the work is crazy. It's crazy. I'll never do it again. So we did it with the Ministry of Higher Education and you know, some NGOs. The project cost was about 2.5 million, so we made our money from event management fees. Huh? So uh, at the same time, you know, I was doing the Gai project, I also signed up for the firm. You know, I wanted something that was a bit more exciting than just doing event management. And uh, eventually, uh, after three months of shooting the program, I won uh, the, the show. So after winning the show, I had many opportunities as well, like uh, employee uh, options and, and stuff, uh, which were well paid as uh, marketing jobs. You know, we wanted young people to run certain divisions. But I decided that you know, uh, since I started Youth Malaysia, you know, and, and I've invested in the people uh, over the past one two years uh, to continue with what I was doing. And then uh, I call it the event trap. You know, I've suddenly stuck in this whole event thing. You know, because after doing Gagaya, I had suddenly so many uh, people calling to do this kind, of, you know, different types of events. And uh, because of the, the network that we have, I finally find myself back into the first business model, which is a linear event uh, you know, company. And uh, so no choice, I mean, because I didn't have a choice, because uh, I mean, you still have overheads, you, you will still have to you know, service clients, and uh, that's where we organize U48, which some of you may have uh, turned up at the first National Youth Entrepreneur Convention. Um, and uh, at that point of time, you know, like a lot of people say, oh, no, that's not bad, I mean, you did U48, it's great and stuff. But, I mean, deep down, so after you it, I felt there was emptiness. I, I thought that, you know, this was not where I wanted to be. A lot of people think it's great. I mean, I mean, like today, what you see, you know, the convention. Uh, this convention, U48, U49, I don't think it's the business model that, you know, I personally want to be in. I think it's great to supplement it, but I think that the business model that's fantastic has to be exponential. You know, it has to be automated. You can plug in, you know, the right people, technology into place. So then, uh, after the first National Youth Entrepreneur Convention, I met Kylie who spoke earlier this morning. And uh, I knew that somehow what's missing is the technology bit. If you notice, like, uh, you know, a lot of our speakers today, you know, when, you're, when you're looking at the technology segment of it, uh, they actually scale much faster as compared to the very traditional businesses because you get a global reach, right? And uh, of course, you, you know, uh, because uh, the reach is, I mean, especially when you target a youth market, everybody's, most of our friends are actually online. So uh, after meeting Kylie and after four months of actually talking to him, working him on a part-time basis, I finally convinced him to leave my Yeah, and then he stepped inside. And uh, over the past like uh, eight months, we, we have started youth sales. Uh, I think maybe some of your members, you know, we, we've got more than eighty thousand members now. That's just eight months ago. You know, we started with zero, and uh, ninety-two percent of them are actually referred by friends. So now you see the difference between the business model for youth sales and what is started doing. You know, because it's like I didn't have an active community. I was doing an event every year, you know, once. So if I do not do that event, there's no revenue that's coming in. But it's because of now with, uh, with the value that we can provide clients on a consistent basis of the community that we've built, uh, we, we have uh, received the uh, 150,000 uh, funding from MDEC. Uh, Rostan was the, you know, the general manager who's uh, in charge of MDEC. Uh, you know, we've got that funding. Uh, in the six months, we have received uh, a few interested venture capitalists who who wanted to uh, invest in our company and to, to buy certain stakes of our company and to bring it into a regional uh, platform. But of course, uh, at this point of time, uh, you know, we, we are not deciding on that. Uh, we are still working hard on it to develop the business model to make sure that you know, uh, we're still putting in effort and keeping it by ourselves because we feel that the business model is not mature enough for us to, to get venture capitalists to come in. You know? uh, so uh, I think that this story until till day, and I'm sure some of you have noticed that you for nine on a separate hall as well. Uh, we are investing one million ringgit uh, for this event itself to uh, basically build the youth community and actually give back to some of the community members. So we're pulling our sponsors that uh, have worked with us on youth sales and stuff to actually build this event and, and to give you guys this hall as well to uh, you know HSBC to, to sponsor this convention and uh, you know the event today. So I think like um, yeah, that, that's about it for the story, you know. Of, uh, where I'm at, you know, they, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joel. All right, just, just, just recap about what he talked about, uh, some points. Uh, first, he said is that his father wasn't very happy at some point of your life, right? 
I think it's quite common for parents not to always agree with the things that you want to pursue. Uh, but entrepreneurship, in my eyes, is not so much about what others want you to do. It's more about what you want to do with your life. Uh, and again, as an entrepreneur, you can do whatever the hell you want to do, uh, even if it's against the words of your parents. But you have to face the consequences of losing. Kasih sayang ibu bapa anda. All right. Uh, the, he talked about the secret of success. Uh, I think in my eyes, and I think in the eyes as well, there is no real secret. There is no one particular formula for you to succeed in your business. It's a matter of luck occasionally. It's a matter of knowing what to do. Uh, and the definition of success is very much different from everyone up on stage, for myself and for you as well. It's not always about money, it's not always about being famous, it's about following your dreams, and most importantly, success should mean that you are happy with your life. Betul, betul. Correct, eh? And uh, he said, after SPM, uh, for most of you guys, because when we are young, our journey is pretty much laid out for us. Education, uh, kindergarten, tanika, sekolah rendah, sekolah menengah. After form 5, you have options. And that is where your life begins. But you have to make, uh, you have to realize your options and basically make sure that you know where you are heading towards and be accountable for your own choices. Uh, he took mechanical engineering because there are a lot of guys there. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got from the talk. You and me, right? What's the engineer, man? I know. <laughs> Uh, he took on rock climbing, uh, one, because it's his passion that he had at the point in time, and sports is a good mechanism for you to instill discipline in yourself because certain rules and prantra that you have to follow. And then I know, I know why you became a teacher as well. I might share something. I might, I might like swimming. He likes to teach rock climbing. Can you climb here? I hold you, huh? I will hold you. Uh, you started off making three ringgit, teaching that. But it wasn't about the money, it was about the booty, wasn't it? <laughs> and then made 130 ringgit doing modeling. And basically, you escalate your income from there. You start small. Uh, even Joyce made 200 ringgit per banner, uh, more or less, when you first started out. And as your business grows, your, your dreams and your expectation for financial returns improve as well. But you start small. And the foundation and you build as time goes by. Right? But the best time to be an entrepreneur is when you are young because your expectation and your quality of life is still quite manageable. As you get older, you cannot buy Titare anymore, must buy the girl drink. Must buy Dutch lady. Live free lah, it's okay. <laughs> Alright, and then uh, it's all about trial and error. Not all business plans are meant to succeed in the beginning. Uh, Joe started off doing, uh, thought about doing MLM. Uh, SMS marketing, events, but uh, not all business ventures are meant to succeed. I personally, <laughs> actually it's not on my profile, uh, I launched a condom store online. See, it's a true story, it's called what? Uh, condom something that comes out my life. I can't remember the name of it. Huge failure to work. It's <laughs> 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 not everybody thought like me, one want to buy discreetly and in large volumes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not always a straight road in terms of your success. There are certain branches along the way that you need to plan for. If your plan A does not work out, you have to plan for plan B and plan C and so forth. And branding is very important, making use of the media. And uh, Joel's choice to enter the firm uh, was a big uh, success in him making himself uh, known to the Malaysian public. And once you are known, it's easier to get uh, appointments, people will start uh, contacting you as well. So making sure or knowing how to use the media, this is all about media entrepreneurship, it's very important. Alright guys, you still with me? Yeah. Empowerment? Yeah. Yes. Yes you can, I guess. Yes we can. Alright, now we have our Q&A session. We have uh, time for only five questions. Uh, you can ask anything that you would like to ask our three speakers about their experience or anything or even your own personal uh, projects or needs. Alright?